Last week, Governor Ifan Okowa of Delta State expressed alarm and sadness in equal measure about what he called the alleged collusion by unidentified armed personnel in a series of renewed attacks by herdsmen on some communities in the state, which left several people dead. However, the Delta State Commissioner of Police, Hafiz Inouye, appeared not to feel the governor's pains as he initially took the report of the attacks and casualties with a pinch of salt. According to reports, the police commissioner had demanded for evidence of the alleged killings, leading to the exhumation of the bodies of eight already buried victims. At this point, we are now being joined by Honorable Emmanuel Mock, an indigent of Delta State, who even before these unfortunate incidents had suggested that federal government should establish a grazing reserve at Sambisa Forest as a possible solution. A politician and former chairman of the National Transformation Party, one of the earlier deregistered parties, Mr. Mock, will also be dwelling on the subject of INEC, registration and funding of political parties, as well as electoral reforms in Nigeria. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Manuel. Good, morning. Good to see you again. Nice. Well, let's Same start here. with uh, your state, Delta State. Yes. Where last week, uh, Thursday, and I think uh, over the weekend, there were reports of attacks, uh, persons were killed, and the community went and reported to the police that, you know, killer hates men. Had again uh, killed some people in uh, uh, around the Uedi, around the Uedi, yes. uh, but the police uh, didn't quite uh, believe the story. They asked for evidence. Eventually, six bodies were exhumed, exhumed okay. and taken to the police station and later to the hospital and the mortuary. Yeah. And still, the commissioner for police is uh, not too sure that this is a case of farmers versus men. Uh, I think his major response that I've read is that. Well, they will still need to investigate to determine who died, where, how, when, and who was responsible. Um, and that's the basis of the introduction by Tundo, yes. when she was saying uh, the governor thinks that this is uh, a case of uh, the uh, security agencies uh, not doing their work properly. But the governor himself had set up a committee on headers and uh, uh, farmers' uh, conflict. Yeah. Is it that that committee is not working? Do you think that the state government is right, the governor in particular, to accuse uh, the uh, law enforcement agencies of uh, treating a, tr a serious matter likely? Yes. Uh, so, sir, we, I believe that the law enforcement agencies are not treating this matter as seriously as they should, because especially for Delta State, this matter of the crisis that's been going on between communities and headers has been going on for quite some time. If you remember sometime around 2015, 2016, a lot of communities around the Kwale, Ndokwa area of Delta State, their farms had been occupied by headers. Even up till now, a lot of those places, people don't go to farms. So at some point, the governor set up this uh, committee and what we call Security Council of Eminent Elders to look at this matter and advise the state government as to how best to approach it as a way of saving lives, as a way of seeing what can be done. And one of the things that uh, came out was that at some point they visited that council, visited the commission of police then. And one of the things the council reported was that the, the commission of police said that the headers are Nigerians and they had a right to also ply their own trade, which is grazing their cattle. But the thing there is, they were occupying farms and destroying farms. And the people were very surprised. Now, with this matter that happened recently in Unuweli, not only is it that people were killed and farms were destroyed, first, these people just moved with a large stock of cattle into farms, in two different communities, and destroyed the farms. These are very large farms, OK? The youths organized themselves and drove these people out of those farms. Okay, and more or less, of course, like a conflict between the communities and the headers. The headers went away, or regrouped and came back. In fact, the rumor going around is that some soldiers were with them when they came back. And if you listen to what the governor said, the governor was actually very angry about the whole of this. It's unfortunate what we are seeing, really. It's very unfortunate what we are seeing, how it's going. Because, yes, headers are Nigerians. Some are. Some, we don't know whether they are Nigerians. They have a right to apply their trade. But in every society, there are laws that you don't destroy somebody's property. If I have a goat and I want to feed my goat, I'll look for a place where I can feed my goat without destroying somebody's farm. But to walk into a farm, and you, I mean, these are not hidden things. A farm is such a large economic enterprise. 
to walk into a farm with cattle and destroy it is a crime. And then you go to the and the police. This is such a big thing that has happened. The destroy, you know, there's no kind of conflict that can cause the damage cows would cause because you know cows are not human beings. When they walk through a farm, you will see the damage they cause. Their hooves and everything is there. So I don't know what investigation the police are investigating in this. And that simple question: Do you think truly that the security agencies are not giving this matter the seriousness it deserves? Yes, because the evidence is there. The evidence is there. And the crisis, sometimes one wonders. It's as if they, you destroy completely the farm. You burn the houses of people. And it's happening across the whole country. Imagine the one that happened in Katsina, if you, if you don't mind my mentioning it. The community head said they came into that community with close to 180 motorbikes with two or three people on them. Now, how can the security people say, first, you have not arrested them? Because, you see, when 10 motorbikes are riding together in convoy, their, their track shows. So imagine them driving into this community, how long they drove into the community, a hundred, even if it's just a hundred bikes. The track of those hundred bikes will tell you where they came from and where they went back to. They came into the community, they didn't steal foodstuff, they didn't steal anything. What the report was that they killed anything inside they could. Women reported that even children were snatched from their hands and thrown into fire. They set everything they saw on fire. Sometimes you hear Boko Haram came to communities and stole the food of the community. This one, they said they burnt all the food. Killed as many as they can, burnt everything they could, and then burnt the food stuff for the place and left. What is that telling you? What are the security people doing about this? The evidence is there. Kassina is sandy. So the tracks of these bikes are there. What's, this is evidence that the security people are not doing anything, as far as I'm concerned. And in Delta, ours has been a situation like... This is 2020. This is 2020. Since the time of Jonathan, we've been having these issues. But now it's increased so much. So many communities. OK, a professor was saying today that they don't even want our people to go to the farms anymore. And in fact, no person would want his parents to go to the farm. No parent would want. In Benue, it was reported three days ago that a woman went to the farm. A headsman accosted her in the farm, told her to put her hand on a log chopped off her hands, and told her to go back home. That's three days ago in Bedouin. So this is the whole country. What, every time they say, we'll look into it. How can you, like the last person you were interviewing said, how can you wait for them to attack you, then you say you reprise them? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me, sincerely. So is what you're saying is that there's a deliberate policy from security agencies to just allow these people to run amok? that they are deliberately turning a blind eye. Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying they are deliberately turning a blind eye. What I'm saying is that nothing is being done. I'm not, I'm not imputing that it's deliberate or whatever, but clearly nothing is being done. Because take like in the areas that they are talking about, the headmen are still there. Listen, you can't move cattle. You can't move because the cattle, it's not if you are moving them with uh, trailers. And so they did something here, you put them in a trailer, and in three hours they've left Lagos, they are past Ogun State. They are walking by leg, their leg. So even in a week, you can still get the cattle. OK, so if it's not complicity, it's incompetence. I'm just trying to understand what For me, what it whether it's incompetence or complicity or, or whatever, I don't know what to Or negligence. Or negligence. Yeah. Better negligence, because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. That's the fact of it. And this nation is going to the dogs across the whole spread of the country, insecurity. Insecure. Even your children are going to school. You are even afraid as they are traveling. Will they get to where they are going? It's a, it's a dire situation. Yes. And this is having huge effects on many things. And I want to talk about the effects that the herdsmen farmers crisis is having on food and security across Thank Nigeria. You. Yes. Because that's a huge aspect. What's your take? You see, I have a friend uh, who's into agriculture. He rents out tractors in Taraba State. He said three years ago he had to stop because it didn't make any sense anymore. When you see a farm of whatever and herdsmen would move in, and the funny part of it is that it's as if they wait till you're about to harvest. That's when they move in and destroy the whole farm. And so that business is just gone, and now he's had to locate to Lagos. Yet in Kwale, Ndokwa, Ueli, in Delta State, let me just say, People hardly go to the farms, except those farms that you can call gardens, which are very near the village. 
One day I was traveling by road. Somewhere there was, the road was bad somewhere around Benin. And the driver entered into some cut off, you know, diversions. You won't believe we passed through this community. I see headsmen with cattle walking through the whole village. In fact, I had to take a video of it. They were even going towards people's kitchens. So, food security is going to actually be a problem in Nigeria because when the middle belt that has been in the, at the receiving end of this matter has been the food basket of Nigeria for forever. And now, Taraba is part of that. Beno is part of that. Plateau is part of that. All of these places. Then now you are coming down now to the south. You hear of Enugu. You are hearing of Delta as we speak. Even we are talking of some incidents in Bayelsa and everywhere. So food, it's not magic. It's either you are importing it or you are farming it. And if you are not able to farm it, then definitely this year I can, I am suspecting that from this year we are going to begin to experience scarcity in food in this well, country. I mean, the information we have uh, from the Bureau of Statistics is that food inflation, you know, is, there's been an unprecedented spike in uh, food inflation, headwind inflation, uh, you know, headline inflation in recent times. So this may be one of the reasons. Exactly. In addition to the closure, closure of the border. Of borders, yes. But, okay, let me ask you. The um, communities, some of the elders in the Niger Delta area, in responding to this latest development in Niger Delta, in Delta State, yes. what they have said is that the states in the Delta area should also come up with their own security network, independent of the police, yes. after the fashion of Operation Amotekun and Operation Shege Kafasa. Yeah. Uh, do you agree that this may be a solution uh, to ensure security of lives and property in that part of the country? Since you say that uh, the law enforcement agency, the police, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, taking it uh, as seriously as, as it seriously should. As it should yes. Sincerely, I totally agree. I totally agree. If you listen to what the governor of Ondo State said about the Samotekung that they set, that the Southwest set up, he said, in every state, first, the police is exclusively the federal government's responsibility. Both state police, states, I mean, police officers and system in the states and at the federal level. They are exclusive the federal government's responsibility. Yet, you find state budget for police being such a gigantic amount out of their expense account for every year. Now, if I'm spending so much money on the police and I don't have control of the same police force, it just does not make sense. I have a crime committed, like now in Delta State, this killing in Uwele. Who is going to investigate it? It's supposed to be the federal police. The commission of police in the state is saying that he's not sure. And this is not something that happened in a day. It took weeks to happen. Meanwhile, the people of Ugeli are expecting protection from Governor Okoa and the government of the place. And so the governor has set up an elders' council, and even the people, the political structures in the place, I mean, people like us, we're talking. There is insecurity. And everywhere they set up vigilante. Meanwhile, you hear the same police people saying they want to mop up arms. You have such a large population of herders armed to the teeth, walking across farms and destroying farms. Then the indigenous people who must also have protection are not getting protection from the police. Because you go to the same police, one policeman told me was that sometimes they buy their own bullet. So what Amotekon has done, what the Yorubas are trying to do or have done is the only solution because really every village needs to be secured. And so the people, the elders of the South South, the elders of the Niger Delta, what they are saying is the only way to go. Because ultimately, we need these farms. If not, people are going to be starving to death in their villages, especially elders. And the only way these elders can eat is their farms. There's no food in the house. You see the elderly mama or something will go to her farm, harvest cassava, go grind some gari and come home. Harvest yam or tomato or ugu and come and cook in the house. When she can't go to the farm, when they can't, even water self, do we really have water? Most places it's, well, it's the Emmanuel river. Well, Mark, we will need to take a short break. When okay. we return, we'll continue with the conversation. We'll yes. be right back. It's still the morning show here on our rice news. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. We're still with Honorable Emmanuel Mock, an indigent of Delta State, talking about the recent farmer herders clashes and the inadequacy of the response of the police thus far. Now, it's really 
most disturbing that eight bodies had to be exhumed, that that level of physical proof had to be provided to give credence to the claim that this farmer herder clashes. And we, shouldn't, we should stop calling it farmer herder clashes, because the farmers aren't clashing with anybody. It's the herders that are <laughs> armed to the teeth, marauding in these areas. So it's not a farmer herder clash. But what is your response now? Because now that eight bodies have been exhumed, and um, the um, Commissioner Inouye is saying he will deal with the perpetrators mercilessly. Do you have any confidence? And you mentioned earlier, before the break, the fact that we're going to be facing a food scarcity shortly. And we now think of the Central Bank of Nigeria and all yeah. their interventions and what have you. It's not going to mean a single thing yeah. if people cannot go to the farms. There will be anchor, borrower, whatever you want to call it. Exactly. If nobody is farming, it doesn't mean anything. This is an emergency. Yes. See, uh, when, for me, I don't see why they needed to exhume eight bodies. What point did they want to prove with the exhumations of eight bodies? The evidence is in the farms. The evidence, is it that the testimony of all the youths of those communities, uh, pictures they took, because, you know, because of phone, phones now, whatever is happening, people tend to capture the events on camera. Is it that they couldn't get any of such things? Going through the farm, they didn't see the hooves of the cattle and all of that. They didn't see evidence of headers armed and coming back to the community that they needed to exhume. The, okay, they want to do a topsy to see whether they had diabetes or they died by malaria or what, or to see the evidence of matched cause of gunshot wounds. Well, they've exhumed the eight bodies. I'm sure in a conflict of fighting where weapons were used, you don't need an autopsy to see the evidence of the fight because you see the injuries, physical injuries on the persons. And so since the exhumations have been done, all the police need to look is see the bodies and they will know whether this person died as a result of conflict, physical, I mean, armed uh, violence. So to say they're now waiting for an autopsy before they know what to do concerning this. Well, I, I, the truth of the matter is this. Eh? We, as the Nigerian people, are not being serious enough about the issues that we are facing as a people of security, of safety, of rights to property, rights to land, of rights to citizenship. Nobody has the right to walk into my compound and set it on fire. And like the president said, you, have, you shouldn't respond, you shouldn't, you shouldn't engage in a reprisal attacks. If somebody comes to attack me, I must defend myself, however best I can. If it is kerosene I have, I'll pour it on him and set him on fire. If it is wood I have, I'll fight for my life and the life of my family. We as a people, when challenged like this, you can't, this cannot continue. Cows cannot be walking around across the whole country, road, bush, farms, and everybody we are just watching at a police force that has not done anything, at a military that has not done it. Because if they have, these people will no longer be walking into people's farms. Simple. For the police to say they need these exhumations and autopsy before they decide, before they do something to arrest these criminals who have perpetrated this crime, is proof to me that they are not taking it as seriously as they should. And personally, we as a people need to rethink security, citizenship, nationhood, and that's what Amotekun is speaking to. And everybody needs to do that. So on that note then, are you suggesting that maybe the South-South also needs its own regional security Yes, outfits? the South East needs it, the Middle Belt needs it, the North East needs it, the people need it, Nigerians need it. You cannot, and the funny part is, even the President said a lot of these people are foreigners. You can't come... Look at what is happening to Chibok. Why are the people still in IDP camps five years after? Four years after they are still in? What? In their own country. How can they? It's like refugees in your own country. And your village is just maybe 10 miles away from here. Even if your house is burnt, if you came back to that burnt house, in two days, you would have created a part of that burnt structure where you can lay your head. And from there, begin to rebuild your life. But... The military who are supposed to drive these people out, stay, put in place structures to guard those communities so that these people can begin to regain their lives, they themselves, from the, some of the things you hear, are not even safe. They are not equipped enough. You just listen to what the last guest on your program was saying. So the people we Nigerians need, see, power belongs to the people. We have abdicated responsibility. 
for our own lives. And I tell you, the more, every day that we allow the same situations to continue going, every day the adversaries get stronger, and every day we the people get weaker. Well, on the question of uh, the menace of uh, headsmen, uh, you were quoted as having recommended that uh, Sambisa Forest should be turned into a grazing reserve. You do mean that as a joke? No. Uh, considering the fact that Sambisa Forest is a war zone, or you were just being sarcastic? No. Listen, at the time we made, at the time we made those comments, I read that was about 19, 2015 or 2014. You remember, just before the 2015 elections, the military went all out to clear the Boko Haram. And by the election time, they had practically succeeded. And that's, at least that's what both the world news agencies and the local news agencies were saying, and that it was to clear pockets of this. Now, now that they had cleared out Sambisa Forest, in that area, the best way to keep security is, even the military says so, that if you are engaged in a war and you capture a territory, you don't leave that territory and go, because if you leave it, they will reconsolidate back in that territory that you just cleared out of them. And so having cleared Sambisa Forest, or even now where we are today, if the, like your uh, last uh, guest was saying, if they put in enough personnel and equipment in this war, to clear out all of these insurgents in the Sambisa forest and that, all of those areas and made it vacant. It's such a large region of vacant land, as was said. That is, in fact, the Sambisa forest is said to be bigger than the whole southeast region. So instead of having herdsmen moving cattle through farms and all of that that's happening, you could create a grazing state or reserve states, more or less like that. And all the cattle be moved. And you see, cattle rearing has become actually a modern scientific business. You, you make, I mean, you, you can farm feeds. You can create stocks, how to feed the cattle and ever how to take care of even their health. It's said even that this long distance work they take is not even good for the cattle. They don't produce enough meat. They don't produce enough milk. This is the fact that even the way that the cattle are being reared, it's not even in the interest of the business. And so as a way of clearing out and dealing with this crisis, we have virgin land that is nobody's farm. It's Nigerian territory. If you now turn it, like they were saying, they were trying to build colonies across the whole country. If you build a major colony in Zambeza Forest and move the cattle, we don't have up to 18 million cattle. We don't have. If could, all the cattle could be brought in there, properly cared for, even the headers, whose children keep walking about, and because of that, we are trying to develop a nomadic education for them because they keep moving about. You'll be able to settle them, and the children will go to school, and every, their health will be better, and the country will be free, the middle belt will be free to farm. Because we need farmlands, just as we need cattle. We also need farmlands. And we cannot keep the two together the way it's going. So that's the, that's the reason. It wasn't a joke at all. It's a way of solving a problem. Separate these two lines of enterprise. Since we have virgin land that is large enough, as large as a region from what is said, such is enough to cater for all of this. Atiku Abubakar himself said he was, going, he was building some feeds plants somewhere in Abuja, farm and feeds plant that would be able to feed a very large percentage of the stock, I mean of the cattle stock in Nigeria. I don't know how far that has gone. Okay? So if we have some desert forest and it's now being occupied by, it's like, it's like a haven for these people. They just kidnap people and go into that place. We don't know what's happening. So as we round up, I want to hear your thoughts on the deregistration of political parties by INEC. Are you in support? In fact, in Nigeria, there's a lot of well, law. One party was also deregistered. Yes. National Transformation Yes, party. National Transformation Are party. you in court? We went to court. We didn't go to court on time because, you know, they say there is a minimum time within which you should go to court. I wanted to go to court, but a lot of my party members, quite eminent people, felt that it's a waste of effort to spend so much money to work to try and work out the country and you get deregistered in one year. That left. Let's come to this deregistration. Even for the courts, this deregistration is lawlessness. And the courts have told INEC. The, the courts have not yet decided in no, the no, the case, courts, the courts taken have to the courts, taken by well, yeah, I said the courts have told to the INEC. Court. In the courts on the 17th, the court told INEC, you were served five times for this case that has been coming since 2017 or so. You didn't appear in court once. The court invited, and because the parties had sought for an injunction to stop INEC from registering the political parties and let the issues be addressed in court, INEC did not appear. 
The Attorney General appeared once, and that was it. And they did not appear. At some point, the court decided to hear the substance, the legality of the case from the parties. And the parties presented their case. So a date was given for like judgment or ruling on that matter on the 17th of February. I neck the register the parties on the 7th. On the 17th of February, when the parties came to court, that day INEC now came. The court, INEC told the court that they did not receive any of the notices. The court presented INEC five different proof of service. That is a lie. You cannot insult the integrity of the courts in Nigeria. That's what the INEC was told. So that registration is null and void. But the matter has been adjourned. You yes. recall yes. that yes. on it's that 17th, yes. INEC was then served there. Correct. The latest uh, you uh, yes. Know, yes. Uh, petition by, exactly. Uh, exactly. by the three political exactly. parties. So the case continues Ex to match. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So now, if you now look at this, if you imagine, you see there's something funny going on. In INEC. You have one minute. Just one minute. Okay. INEC had registered so many parties in 2012. That's when we were registered. Just you're coming to election 2015. You now register almost 70 political parties. Or how many? Almost 50 or so new political parties. One year after, I mean, how many years after you register these parties, you deregister all of them again? Why? What's, what's your game? What are you playing? Is it that? Not why? all of them. 74 yes. of them. Not all of them. Good. Now look at this. Even the rules, you know there's a new electoral law that the National Assembly had presented to the president. Three times the president refused to sign that new electoral law. I next the registered, I next power that is claiming it has, but which it registered these parties, is based on those new, this new electoral law, which has not been signed into law. Do you understand me? So you are, I don't know, lawlessness is taking over. They just do, the Nigerians just do what they like as if there is no law in the country. And you can't go forward when you run a state like that. But shouldn't there be more clarity from the get-go in terms of registering political parties? Don't, it's, it's, become, it's become a free-for-all, but we have run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us this yeah, morning. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much.